In this video, we will discuss the Lax-Milgram theorem. Let me start with giving a definition, the definition of coercivity. So, we'll have a Hilbert space H, and let me take A, a bilinear form from H times H to R. So, A is a bilinear form. We will say that this bilinear form is coercive if there exists a constant alpha, which is strictly positive, such that for all x in h, axx will be greater than alpha times the norm of x squared. Now, I would like to stress a few points here. First, when I write the norm of x squared, basically norm of x, that norm is the norm that derives from the inner product of the Hilbert space. So, if you are to change the Hilbert space, that norm here, norm of x, which will eventually square, will change. So, you see that is really dependent on the Hilbert space. That's the first thing I would like to say. The second thing I would like to say is what it means. What it means is that when, when, when x goes to plus infinity, then your axx has to, has to go to plus infinity as well, and it has to go in a way that is somehow bounded below by some kind of a parabola, a paraboloid, if you prefer, this uh, multi-dimension. That is the intuition behind it, okay? So that is what coercivity means. A bilinear form is coercive if when it goes to plus infinity, it does this, okay? That is coercivity. Let me give you some examples here, uh, obviously very simple examples. I mean, what, what we're going to be interested in eventually is coercivity in very complicated uh, Hilbert spaces, which is L2, H1. But let's try to understand on the very, very simple uh, Hilbert space, R2. Uh, if you take this, uh, this, this bilinear form AXY, uh, 2X1, Y1 plus 3X2, Y2, then AXX, will be 2x1 square plus 3x2 square. So, as you can see, if you take in, in R2 the, the usual uh, Euclidean norm, then what you have is that axx will be greater than a constant. Uh, I'll let you uh, see which constant it is, um, times the norm of x square in that, uh, in that R2 space. So, what we're saying is that we have a bilinear form that is coercive. However, if you replace the plus sign by a, a negative sign here, it will not be coercive. As you can see, the, 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 the shape of this, uh, of this bilinear form, if you, if you want, I mean, if you, if you actually do uh, xx, uh, that, that will actually be the, the, the saddle on a horse and obviously it's not going to be coercive, it's not going to plus infinity in plus infinity, when one side will actually go down uh, to actually minus infinity, if you, if you, if you get on the right, on the right, um, um, the right way. Uh, basically, where, where you put your legs on the saddle, well, uh, obviously, uh, that, that, that's, that's the shape, otherwise you would not be able to sit on the horse to begin with, right? So, uh, that one is not coercive. Uh, if you look at the third one, 2x1, y1 plus 1y, x1, y2 plus x2, y1 plus 4, x2, y2 right here uh, at the bottom, then um, you may want to just stop this video for a second, think about it, see if you can actually figure it out. And if you can figure it out, then uh, actually just you're probably back now. Uh, and if you're back, you have found that this is not coercive. Coercive? It is coercive. Indeed, uh, you can just replace x and I mean y by x, and it's going to be axx, and you can just show that uh, well the double product here can be uh, put in some kind of a canonical form where this will actually be a sum of squares, and eventually you can actually show that this is greater than a constant times the norm of x squared. All right, so these were actually pretty simple examples, even though we're kind of playing a joke here. Uh, it's actually pretty simple. What we will need to do, though, is to do the same kind of things in functional spaces where H is most likely going to be something like, um, you know, subspace of uh, L2 or something of the sort. So that might be a little bit more complicated, but we'll, we'll get to this uh, in, in the next section, actually, when we'll do the well-posedness of uh, some of the elliptic PDEs. All right, 
That was coercivity. Let's move on to continuity, which is something you already know. Uh, let's H be Hilbert space. You know what continuity is, uh, but I just would like to, to emphasize how you can write it if you have a bilinear form. And the way you can write it is this way, AXY smaller than a constant times the norm of X times the norm of Y. Of course, this norm again is the norm that derives from the inner product of your Hilbert space. You change the Hilbert space, you change the continuity property. So you could be, possibly you can be continuous with one Hilbert space, but not with another one. So that will align the fact that choosing the right Hilbert space for uh, what will come up is really important. Now, uh, as you know, uh, when, when we're saying uh, continuity, some people are probably thinking, but I thought that all linear functions were continuous to begin with. So how is this even a problem? Well, it is a problem because in, in finite dimensional spaces, uh, you can have functions that are linear, but not continuous. I mean, continuity is guaranteed from linearity in spaces that are finite dimension. But if you are in infinite dimension, you don't have continuity as a side product from linearity. So uh, you need to be careful and you need to prove continuity uh, when, when you need it. All right, so we define coercivity. We remind you of what continuity was. Well, let's now uh, actually state the lax milgram theorem. Okay, so we're going to start with H, a Hilbert space, and we are going to consider A, a bilinear form that will be both continuous and coercive. Then we will choose an F in H prime, in the dual space to H. Again, that is a linear and continuous function from H to R. Now, here is what the theorem states. The equation for all u in H, axu equals f of u, has one solution, and only one solution, so it's unique, and the application that maps f, the right-hand side, to x, is both linear and continuous from h prime to h. Okay? That is the lax milgram theorem. Now, I would like to emphasize uh, pretty much all the, all the players here in this, in this equation. First, I would like to stress that uh, this has to be true, that equation here has to be true for all u in H. So U will be some kind of test function. On the right hand side you have F. F is somehow the data. It's, it's the, it's the right hand side to your equation. And X is the solution you're looking for. Okay? So what we're saying is that uh, the, the Lax-Milgram uh, theorem, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you meet the requirement, if you meet the hypothesis for this theorem, it will tell you that this equation has a solution and the solution is unique. That's the first item. And the second item to the list is that the application that takes an F right hand side and gives you that solution will be continuous. In other words, if you change the right hand side a little bit, then the solution to your equation will change a little bit. You will not be in a situation that we described at some point in chapter one, where you had a small variation in the data, and all of a sudden you had a huge variation of the solution, and that was chaos, remember? So that is not what we will have. The lax milgram theorem will tell you you will not be in that chaotic situation. You will actually be in a very, very comfortable situation where you change a little bit your data, it changes a little bit your solution. Okay? All right. Now, the proof of this theorem is actually provided on the website, uh, so you can, you can read it. It's, um, it, it. Basically, you have two versions. You have the version where A is uh, symmetric, and the proof is very easy. 
and you have the situation where A is not symmetric, where the proof is a little bit more complicated. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not saying that we, you need A to be symmetric, I'm just saying that in the case A is symmetric, the proof is easier. But of course, we have not required A to be symmetric in this theorem, all we are requiring is A to be continuous and coercive. Let me give you an example of application of this theorem, uh, a very, very simple uh, example, actually. Uh, I'm going to take this, it's even too simple. Uh, be reassured, in the next video, we'll apply the lax milgram theorem to something more serious. But I just wanted to show you how it works if you take that very simple um, Hilbert space H, which uh, is uh, R2. Okay, so let's say that, I mean, the, the question is, can we find x1 and x2, a vector x in R2, such that for all vectors y in R2, y1, y2, we have this equation, say, 2x1, y1, plus x1, y2, plus x2, y1, plus 4x2, y2, equals y1 plus y2. Okay, can I find x1 and x2 such that this equation is satisfied? Well, uh, the lax milgram theorem will tell you uh, yes if you are meeting the requirement to apply the lax milgram theorem. So let's see if that is the case. Okay, so H, that's a Hilbert space. R2 is Hilbert space, no problem. I mean, there is an inner product. Uh, I have the, 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 the it's complete for that inner product, no problem. Okay, uh, now let me consider this uh, bilinear form AXY, which is basically the left-hand side to my equation. And let me consider the right-hand side, which is going to be f, and that will be y1 plus y2. Now, obviously, uh, as we said, h is Hilbert space. Obviously, a is bilinear. It is coercive. We actually saw that uh, earlier. And it is continuous. Now, what about f? Well, f is linear. And quite frankly, it is obviously continuous as well. Now, we are in a finite dimensional space, so it's not exactly like a big deal. Uh, it's not like we just found something that is incredible. Uh, of course, it is continuous. So what we're saying is that we are in the setting where we can apply the lax milgram theorem. So let's do apply the lax milgram theorem. And what we have is that for all y in H, there exists a unique x such that axy equals f of y. On top of this, if I change f a little bit, let's say for instance, instead of having y1 plus y2, I have 0.99y1 plus 1.001y2. Then what we're saying is that the solution will be not so far away from what it is for that y1 plus y2. We have continuity. All right. Okay, um, well, Obviously, uh, using this uh, lax milgram theorem to solve that problem is a little bit like using like big guns to actually kill a mosquito. Uh, you could solve the problem without lax milgram, obviously, by noticing that the equation can be written simply as well, you know, y1, y2, a matrix x1, x2, and the right hand side x, y1, y2, but put everything in the left. Uh, in the left hand side of the equation uh, and then what you need to have if you want y1 y2 if you want this to be to, to be to be satisfied for every y1 y2 then obviously you need the right and the, 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 the second part of this of this uh, the, what is in the parenthesis to be equal to zero so what you need to have is to have x1 x2 equals to the inverse of this matrix uh, times 1 1 and of course I mean I'm pretty sure you know how to solve this problem and that will give you x1 equals 3 7 and x2 equals 1 7 obviously not only only did we prove that there was a, few, a, a, a unique solution, a, a solution, a unique solution, we actually found, found the actual value. Note that Lex Milgram in usual, usually does not give you, uh, does not tell you what is the solution, it just tells you there is a solution, but it does not explicitly tell you here it is. By the way, if uh, you are to replace x1, I mean y1, y2 to the right hand side by say c1, y1 plus c2, y2, uh, in other words, if you replace 1, 1 by c1, c2, then what you end up with is 
x1, x2, which is 4, 7, c1, minus 1, 7, c2, and 2, 7, c2, minus 1, 7, c1. And obviously, uh, you know, if c1 is equal to c2 is equal to 1, then you get 3, 7, 1, 7. But if you're slightly off, then obviously you have continuity uh, with respect to c1 and c2 as expected from the lax milgram theorem. So the mapping from R2 to R2 that associates C1, C2 to X1, X2 is indeed continuous. All right, so again, lax milgram works, but we could have solved the problem with a different method. However, uh, later, um, especially in the next chapter, which, I mean, sorry, in the next section, which is coming up now, then you're going to be very happy to have Lax Milligram. So let's get together to watch the next video uh, and how to use Lax Milligram to prove existence and uniqueness to some elliptic PDs.